Hey everyone, I'm Adrian. Uh, I'm the founder of The Proof and I'm here today with Steph. Nice to meet you guys. I'm the founder of Levit uh, Levitate Foundry. We're here with cool. Hugh Thomas. Yeah, um, I have to introduce my friend Hugh, uh, CEO and founder over at Ugly Drinks, also a fellow Brooklyn resident. Um, so yeah, Hugh, to kick things off, could you just give us a quick rundown, one, of your background, and then two, how you got Ugly Drinks off the ground? Yeah, I mean, nice to meet everybody. I'm Hugh. I'm the CEO, co-founder of Ugly. Uh, I am not from America, but I do live here. So I'm from the UK. Um, Ugly looks like this. You may or may not have seen it. It's a flavored sparkling water business um, that was initially started in the UK, what, just over four years ago now, um, where we built the UK's first kind of flavored seltzer brand. There's no LaCroix or anything like that in the UK. Now in 5,000 stores there, Moved over here two years ago to launch the brand in the US. Uh, we're now in over, what, 15,000 stores globally. And we're we've always been available direct to consumer on Amazon, in stores, and have a full omni-channel approach to trying to build a brand. Um, ugly kind of stands uh, to tell the ugly truth. And we want it to be rebellious, disruptive, take on big soda, big sugary, sweet and soft drinks, um, and speak to a generation that is post-soda and doesn't drink it anymore or wants to move away from it. So we have a range of fruit flavors and we've also been testing some of our more interesting flavors like cherry cola, Dr. Ugly, orange soda flavored seltzers on our direct to consumer platform over the last 12 months. Um, started the business uh, bootstrapped totally um, whilst working in my old job, which was at Vitacoco, the coconut water company. I used to lead European marketing there uh, when it first launched in the UK. Um, and have slowly built the brand, meeting investors along the way, met some of our seed investors whilst we were doing demos in Whole Foods in London, um, and kind of have taught, totally self-taught ourselves building this business. Uh, so it's not the result of a business school case study or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, really excited to chat to you guys about it and happy to go into anything on it, really. I love it. Um, yeah, to kick things off, so I'm really curious from a team and workflow standpoint, can you walk us through some of the differences between when you first launched Ugly versus where you are today. I'm sure there's a stark contrast. Yeah, I mean, last 12, I mean, it, it's actually interestingly speaking to you today because it's 12 months today since we went, went totally remote as an organization and actually left our, our left our awesome thing, left our, um, our we workspaces in both the UK and the US. Um, and so that's been an interesting change, but I think Ugly as an organization had always had been remote focused um, but very early on, it started with myself and my co-founder, Joe, working out of my front room in London. Uh, we then moved our, you know, our initial office was actually an old shipping container, which was converted into office space. It's actually a Dutch student accommodation. And then our first five or six employees all worked from that shipping container in South London, um, which was in like a little industrial park. And we had product in there, point of sale, everything, desk set up. It was pretty awesome. There were like cafes downstairs made out of shipping containers. So a bit like a village vibe with different startups. Um, uh, and then uh, we got a more permanent office in London. And when I moved over to the US, it was just me and a suitcase. So the team then had the CEO founder living in another country in a different time zone. So this was like two, two and a half years ago. And that was when I think Ugly became Zoom, Slack, everything that everybody uses every day now. We've been using Zoom like pandemic style for over you know, a year or so with the, the company in two countries. Um, we actually grew the team quite quickly and we had a lot of employees maybe a year and a half ago. And since then, the people have moved on and decided to go and do different things. We've actually tried to keep the team a little leaner. Um, so now we're a team of seven and we actually work with a lot of different third parties in both countries. And we think there's been a lot of flexibility from that, certainly in the post-COVID world of working remotely, using a lot of software, a lot of tools, and then outsourcing to trusted partners. Um, and so far that's been working really well, which is counter to maybe where I thought the business would have gone five years ago. So a lot to unpack, but hopefully that was interesting. Um, I'm curious, what is your, specifically with workflows, you mentioned like your tool stack, um, just from like a, a, a team standpoint, what does that look like right now? Uh, so, so Slack is like the hub of the business, um, notion kind of, uh, you know, it does plug in, but we do have, you know, in beverage in particular, we do have employees of all different backgrounds and experiences. We have a lot of, you know, field beverage staff that aren't necessarily sat at a desk all day. So we've had to kind of build our systems that 
if you're sat at a desk and working at home like I am, can work for you. So Dropbox, Notion, Slack, mainly build the hub of that or have done. We are looking at different tools all the time. Um, and obviously Zoom um, and, and kind of how that all works together. Certainly internationally, that's worked really well. So you kind of wake up to Slack messages in the morning from the UK. If you're me, you go to, you wake up in the morning in the UK with Slack messages from me in the, in the morning there. Um, so that's been interesting, but then we have had to find ways that for field team members or sales team members who are out and about traveling a lot, um, selling beverages uh, to also integrate into that. And I think that's something we're still trying to get right because those guys can be maybe off Slack or Slack can drain your phone whilst you're in the field, uploading pictures, et cetera. So we have to find ways for everybody to feel part of the organization whilst they might be offline for 10 hours and then come back on and there's, you know, hundreds of messages. So we're still trying to find the right balance. So it's actually something we had a talk about this morning. And I think what we're trying to introduce is like constant periods of refinement and almost a process in itself of refining the processes, <laughs> which is ironic. Um, so there's a meeting now about processes going in probably it's for us to review next week, how we go into what we hope is coming out of coronavirus and out of a pandemic situation and what those processes now evolve to look like. So kind of in flux, I guess is the answer, but um, Slack is kind of the hub uh, of the energy now that we're not all together, certainly, which used to be the, the office. But like I say, being international early has meant that we've always had two multiple hubs. That's awesome. Remember when Slack shut down for, I don't know, six hours at the beginning of February? I think it shut down a lot of virtual offices. No, I, yeah. I, we didn't know what to do with ourselves. We were texting yeah. each other like, is it just me or is it, is the, is it actually down? And then you obviously you go straight to Twitter, right? Which gives you the answer the fastest. So right. yeah, it was pretty, pretty scary, I think, for a lot of workplaces. It's a digital <laughs> world now. Yeah. So I know one of, obviously one of your brand's key differentiators, I mean, not to mention, you know, just the branding itself, but you guys have a very unique POV on, you know, from other sparkling waters in the market. And I think yeah. your tone of voice, your marketing message, why is it called ugly? Like I've been following you guys for a while. So what's sort of the inspiration thought process yeah. behind that strategy and what was your intention? Yeah. So it starts ultimately with two guys in their early twenties in the pub in London and we were rebellious you know, when we had the idea for the brand, I was 23. I wanted to do something big. I wanted, if I was going to start a business, I wanted to do something that was disruptive and took on a big problem in the world. And we felt at the time that, you know, we were working at Vitacoco, which is a healthier beverage. And we were seeing a lot of consumers going, actually, I don't want to drink a sports drink. I want to drink something natural, or I don't want to drink a juice because it's full of sugar. We still felt, how can you create a more fun way to consume water and the water brands in the UK at the time were from mountains or tropical islands and um, the sustainability angle there wasn't quite there and then you just look at the stats and uh, soda is just in this country and back home it's just massive it's so big it's hundreds of millions of consumption occasions um, I think roughly 60% of Americans and 60% of Brits are overweight 30% of Brits and 30% Americans are obese and really that's happened in the last 50 years, um, those stats have changed. And, and it's driven by changes and things like addition of things like high fructose corn syrup and sugar. And particularly when you drink those in beverage, um, that affects your insulin, your pancreas and weight gain massively. And you can see during coronavirus that I think 90% of fatalities are linked to obesity or being overweight. And so, you know, there are real problems here and the problem comes from the system and the products that we're eating and drinking and the marketing. And the marketing, when you have sodas sponsoring the Soccer World Cup, the Olympics, um, with taglines that talk about happiness or talk about making people, you know, have, you know, really fun experiences and smiling, happy people in adverts. At the end of the day, if you've got 100 million pre-diabetics in America, you've got a real problem and sh drinking sugar and drinking calories is an issue. So we recognized that quite early. And so we had that kind of frustration with an industry and like a big enemy, I guess, from a branding point of view to tackle. Um, and then when we were developing the brand, it was actually at the time where previous president now in America had invented the phrase fake news and alternative facts. Um, and it was around the time of, of that election 
Um, and the book 1984 um, by George Orwell was trending again. And there's a line in there which is, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And there was something that, as young people, we felt like, you know, can you really trust what you're reading? Can you trust the news? What should I trust? Like, what, you know, what's correct anymore in that, like, that time when it was like, everything's all over the place. We just felt when you look at big food and drink, it's very similar. You turn around the pack, you can't read the ingredients, the marketing's telling you it's going to keep you awake all night and make you look like a bronze Adonis in the morning. It never happens. And so we just wanted to tell the truth as a revolution. And that's where we came to the idea of the ugly truth and like really kind of just saying it as it is, no sugar, no BS. It's a, you know, it's, it's a brand that just speaks for everyone. It's flavored sparkling water, cut your soda, get rid of the calories, just have something you can enjoy without any guilt. And that's where the, the ethos and the disruptive nature of it came from. And then visually we translated that through. So it's obviously a massive subversive part of the brand. We were all inspired by people like Banksy, street artists like that, who use subversive techniques and cartoon style to say very serious messages. And so we didn't want, although it is genuinely ugly, I think we, it wasn't necessarily the human side of the brand we wanted. We wanted to use cartoon colors and soften a quite serious message so that we could broaden its mainstream appeal. So we use cartoon characters, we use bubble font, we use bright colors to tell a very subversive message that I don't think would be taken as seriously or as mainstream wise from me being, you know, deliciously hue doing yoga with my signature on the can. No offense to those brands. Um, <laughs> but that's kind of, that was just our instinct at the time. And it seems to have resonated really well. So that's kind of the, the whistle stop of, well, it's a process that's ongoing, but that's kind of how I see it. I love that you just said that. The, you're, you're bearing to light the ugly truth and that, what a great, I mean, I love that. That's a great story. And how, how has the branding, you feel, do you feel over the years, how has that set you apart? I know you mentioned you started the company when you were 23 and it's been years yeah. since then. So how have you seen that sort of age with the times? Yeah, I think one of the really interesting things about it has, has been that we designed it to be kind of gender and background neutral. So that was a big thing for us early on is that a lot of healthy products generally trend towards uh, women and female consumption um, because women are generally smarter when it comes to eating and drinking healthier, or at least pick it up first. Um, and a lot of the branding kind of uh, nudges in that direction. We wanted to create something that was very modern in the sense of being kind of like gender neutral um, and for everyone, all backgrounds, you know, wherever you come from in the world, this is a product that speaks to you. And that was why we started this, you know, you can see each of the products has a character, each of the products has a, a tone of voice and an attitude. And um, we can continue to expand that as we add new characters to it. Um, but you'll see there's not like a specific, you know, there's people, there's like characters of all backgrounds. We're bringing in different tone of voices. It's kind of like a gender neutral tone of voice. And that differentiates us in beverage, certainly in sugar-free and healthier beverage, uh, certainly in the seltzer space as well. Um, and so it opens up a whole new demographic that may not be drinking sparkling water that could come, especially young men or male consumers in particular who typically don't shop the sparkling water category. Um, so that's been something I'm like, A, I think that brands should be for everyone anyway, or at least aspire to be. Um, and B, that is when you're talking about soda consumption and like $90 billion worth of consumption, you kind of have to create something that people can afford and affordability has always been a big thing and also feel like they can approach without feeling like it's on a pedestal or making health not approachable for them, which is, we wanted to make water more fun ultimately and fun enough for someone to pick up instead of picking up the brightly colored soda that is on Fortnite and sponsoring their favorite Twitch gamers. So like, that's kind of what we're trying to, trying to do. We're not where we want it to be yet, but that's the ambition. It's interesting. You mentioned a really good point that I think a lot of our clients that levitate, you know, they try to use brand as a way to incentivize new buyers of a category to adopt a category. Have you been, do you feel like you've been successful with that through the branding? You mentioned yes. that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess we, we have two markets, right? So in the U S sparkling water and that market is something we're disrupting. Whereas in the UK, we're disrupting, a different category and soda and bringing and creating a category at the same time. So I think it's been a bit of a, a yin and yang in the sense that, you know, 
it looks disruptive, it stands out on shelf. So often we get people to pick it up for the first time to discover what it is. In the US, I think the response to that because of the expectation setting of where it sits within the shelf, where, where people are going in the store, it's a great tasting seltzer that's fun and has interesting flavors and a fun brand. In the UK, where someone's maybe been drinking diet soda for 20 years and picks this up out of the chiller, it's, there's a bit of education that takes place. So I think that's a delicate balance that we've been learning how to do, keep a global brand that does, actually has two challenges in two markets, which is no easy feat. Um, but I think what I would say is like, whether it's right or wrong, ugly is just purely authentic. This is exactly what Joe, my co-founder and myself, like it came from the heart. When we saw the branding and worked with the branding agency, we worked with people who got it who got us, who got that like angst, the rebellion, everything we did, we did because it was brave. When we saw the name, when we felt the name, it made us uncomfortable. Um, This is, it's purely authentic. It comes from our soul and it can't be copied because of that. So you cannot replicate our style because it would be impossible because it comes from us. Um, You can't copy what's uh, like coming from our company and our soul, right? And when we hire people, they fit that DNA. Whereas I, my critique of a lot of brands developed at the moment is that they're very similar because the design and brand cues are f- quite formulaic and might work in the short term, but in the long term, that's not how iconic brands are built. My, the brands I aspire to, not in terms of ingredient and product delivery, are Oreos, Mountain Dews, Cheez-Its, Doritos. Like They're the brands that people are consuming billions of dollars worth, Tide detergent, which I think is one of the best designs ever. Um, but that's just my aesthetic and my preference. And I know um, that can create disruption in our category to answer your question. And that creates challenges for us, but also opportunities in the long run because of the protectability of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, w- w- one of the follow-ups I had specifically working with a branding agency, I know Steph has a lot of thoughts here as well, because <laughs> uh, she runs an agency with a ton of brands. Um, but what advice would you have? Um, a lot of founders talk to me and like they're just engaging a brand agency. So it was specifically working through brand strategy and visual identity. Like what did that process look like? I'm sure you have a ton of learnings there. I have my thoughts, right? And people probably scream at me saying them or critique them. But um, obviously had, we had a vision that we wanted, we felt before we went and briefed branding agencies, but we actually went in with, um, my, my opinion is you want to, you want to, you have to get the balance between client and agency right. You have to let the agency work their magic and feel like they can take risks because the magic is in the edges in those risks. And so if you're too prescriptive or put guide rails in and guardrails in, in the wrong areas, you can destroy the work and destroy the brief at the same time. But that being said, I still think having some constraints and some guide rails is actually create can create creative opportunities right so what i mean by that is we had a couple of mandatories and then the rest of the brief we did was actually i think we just had a powerpoint with times new roman and very much like prescriptive this is what we're thinking no design cues in there at all no inspiration i don't think maybe one page of but very like very much like we want to see what you guys think. We want to see your interpretation of it. Here's two or three things that we must have. I think we had the name and we had the, I think I wanted, we wanted a big logo sideways, right? Or something like that, I think. But other than that, we were like, do what you want. And even that, stretch us. And the best work we got back is the work that respected what we wanted, but stretched us and made us feel uncomfortable. And my advice to anyone would be, when you go and see work from a branding agency or they send it to you, don't feed back the same day. I always, always sleep on the work. I always um, go to bed or not straight away afterwards because like whatever time, depending on the time of day, obviously, but I always let it percolate before I write my feedback or give feedback. So in the meeting, I'll never be like, love it, hate it, don't like it. Um, And I learned that early on because you would begin to adjust to work and you begin to let it seep in. And then you it changes your view of it and i I do think 24 hours can change the way you see work um i don't know what you think steph i mean you're the other side but that as as like client side like in previous jobs and also starting my own brand i love to be stretched and do brave stuff that's scary um and if you tell an agency that's what you want to do then sometimes you're going to have to feel uncomfortable and then you have to sit with the discomfort 
Um, and sometimes you still won't like it, but you've at least got to give it a chance to settle in. And I, I sometimes think that clients can be too prescriptive on what they want and then be disappointed with the results. And that is not the client agency relationship that is for me most successful. I don't know what you think. But. I could not agree with you more. I think um, a lot of but they're ve they're very non-descriptive. So like I want this. I want I want it to look like Apple meets um, Nike meets <laughs> Ugly Drink and you're like okay those three brands have nothing in common. <laughs> they are very <laughs> different, right? Um, so yes, I completely agree with you. I wish there that's, I mean, and that's why branding is, is the big bucks, right? It, it really takes someone to be able to take you through a brand process and distill what does one like and not like about the brand? Because it's so easy sometimes just to say, hey, I love that personality or I love that tone of voice, or maybe yeah. I just love that font. Um, how do I create something that's like a mix of all of it? But yeah. going, going back to your brand, I think you, I, I really resonate with what you said earlier, which is like, this is your truth. And yep. this is your authenticity. And you just went with your heart. You and your co-founder at the age of 23 created a very sort of heart centric, like you're very purposeful in what you did. And you wanted to basically create a brand that, you know, bore the truth of the industry. And it feels like authentic brands today win because they are authentic and they have purpose. And there's something, I think there's something like intangible that you can't yeah. quantify. People feel that energy. They feel the love behind the brand. It's, it's a great point, Steph. And, and the thing is that I, I, I was just thinking as you were speaking then, um, sorry to interrupt, but um, the brand isn't just the packaging, right? The brand isn't just the website. The brand is actually every employee we hire and every phone call and every email they send and every text message they send and everything they say to somebody. So if you don't understand, you know, Simon Sinek's golden circles, right? Start with why, read the book. Watch the TED, watch the 10 minute TED clip and then save yourself buying the book. I like the book as well, actually, buy the book. Um, but like, that's where we started from. The packaging was an outset. It, if, imagine if it's concentric circles, we started in the middle. The can is like one of those concentric circles on the outside alongside website, merchandise, point of sale. The can is one output of the brand, but like we actually started right in the center. What do we stand for? Why does this exist? What's this all about? And, and therefore, who do we hire? How do we speak? What do our presentations look like? Um, everything communicates, right? Everything we do. We don't always get it right, but like that's what I'm obsessed with. And so, you know, you get a D2C delivery from Ugly. The box flaps have communication on the inserts, the can, the, the outer case, the POS, the emails you get, the text message you get. Um, we still haven't got every touch point right, but like that's the philosophy, um, which like you say, unless you get that to your core, you're going to spend a lot of money with a lot of agencies branding a lot of things and to get it consistent and certainly to get it consistent internationally, which is a whole different kettle of fish, like is really difficult unless you're really clear on what that is. And for me now, like I can't approve every piece of output for higher people that get it as well. And it's much easier to train people who get it inherently and share that shared DNA and values. Um, because then you don't put work out there that doesn't fit in. And that's how we've scaled the brand. And like, there's lots of things we could do better. But one of the things I would say we have done is our brand consistency internationally. Yeah. You know, whether, we're in, whether you're buying it in Los Angeles, New York, the UK, Finland, the brand is the same. Um, and that's, that's taken a lot of work and a lot of process um, and a lot of discipline. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I could not agree more. I'm learning so much from you on this call too. And I resonate <laughs> with everything you're saying, because even in terms of hiring your next employee, yes, it's about skill set and all those other, you know, more hard and hard and soft skills, but most importantly, it's about heart. And, and does your, does your next employee match with your brand? Cause whether you like it or not, they, they're a face of your brand too. Yeah. And everything you just said makes so much sense. I'd, I'd love to further this conversation, <laughs> but I think we're out of time. So this is the perfect place to, to wrap up. Um, yeah, I think on a bright note, I'm going to let you answer this last question. Um, so can you, can you share with us a little bit more about some of the big wins at ugly over the last six months and what do you have planned for, for the rest of 2021? 
Yes, we're, we're launching in. Um, we're launching our new soda lead flavors into the mainstream range uh, over the coming months. So we actually last year launched some of those limited editions, direct and direct consumer only. The best ones we're launching into the main range. So next month we're launching our cherry cola flavored seltzer as an unlimited edition. Doctor Ugly, the orange soda, the fruit punch. And they have, and I can't say that retailers, but we have about 10,000 stores of distribution lined up for those products in the next three months. Um, and they'll be available online first to direct consumer consumers. And then we've got more flavors coming. So we're launching a limited edition product every month this year. Uh, and then the best performing of those will join the main range. Um, so I think that's the most exciting stuff we've got going on. Um, and if anybody wants to find out more, uglydrinks.com. And you can find me, I'm Ugly Hugh, pretty much everywhere. I think Adrian's, Adrian's everywhere I am. So if you know where he is, you can find me. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions and I'll always help anyone on the same journey because I've had lots of help coming. Amazing. Amazing. Well, We're so excited to hear that. Uglydrinks.com, you'll find it in the comments <laughs> below and we'll, we'll have it roll through here as well. Thanks. Amazing. Thanks, you. Appreciate it, man. No worries. I loved it. <laughs> All right. I'll see you guys. Thank you.